Welcome to the third webinar in the ANZOG CPI series on reimagining government. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all of the lands in which participants in this webinar find themselves, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and any other Indigenous elders with us today, and to our friends in New Zealand, Tenakoto Katoa. My name is Jane Francis Kelly, and I'm Deputy CEO for Education at ANZOG. I'm locked down in Melbourne, and in those circumstances, I'm fortunate to share my home with a beautiful rescue cat called Mora. I mention this because it doesn't work to lock her out of the room, she'll just mew. So if we all see a large fluffy tail going across the screen, we will just carry on and pretend it didn't happen. But enough about my cat. This evening's discussion is about meaningful measurement. Our current system of measurement in the public sector is not working. A focus on metrics designed for control creates gaming, perverse incentives, and ultimately makes the job of public servants harder. To discuss this conundrum, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's panel. First, let's welcome Sarah Fernandez. Sarah is the CEO of Oxford Hub, a local charity that works to make Oxford a better place for everyone. Sarah is also a research fellow at the Centre for Youth Impact. Good morning, Sarah. It's Oxford, England, right? <laughs> Adrian Brown is the executive director of the Centre for Public Impact. Before that, he held a range of positions in the UK government, including at the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit and the Strategy Unit. Good morning, Adrian. And Jenny Lewis is Professor of Public Policy at the University of Melbourne and President of the International Research Society for Public Management. Good evening, Jenny. Good evening. Some technical things to note before we go any further. Please stay on mute with your video off. Please note the webinar is being recorded and will be published with automated captions. Please contribute comments and questions to chat from the very beginning. And please tweet using hashtag reimaginegov. The order for this evening, uh, this morning, is as follows. We'll start in a second with a Zoom poll to decide on the first question we'll put to the panel. Then we'll carry on for another 25 minutes asking questions of the panel, including those which came from your community of practice Miro boards. Then we'll split you into groups for 10 minutes and give you some questions to discuss and report back on. Finally, we'll have about half an hour of panel discussion based on your reflections from group discussions. So we're due to finish at 6.15 Australian Eastern Standard Time, when I will collapse with a glass of Pinot Noir. So let's start voting on the one question you'd most like to see put to the panel. Shannon, can you put up the poll? So the questions are, number one, in your experience, how do governments currently approach measurement and evaluation? Number two, what does it mean for governments to measure in a meaningful way? Option three, I can't read, <laughs> it should say it says options. Option three, can you give some examples of governments embracing innovative approaches to measurement and evaluation? And option four, what do you see as being the main barriers to measuring more meaningfully and how might we begin to address them? Wow, that was quite close. Oh, it's still, we're still going. Would anybody like to vote who hasn't voted yet? Not least because we currently have a draw and we didn't, um, <laughs> discuss what to do in the event of a draw. Anybody else like to vote? Yes, we've got a winner. Well done. All right, it looks like option four um, uh, has won. So uh, that is what do you see as being the main barriers to measuring more meaningfully and how might we begin to address those? Um, can I start with Jenny? Um, what, do, what, what do you think of that question? Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. I um, guess I'm not surprised that people chose this one. So what are the main barriers to measuring more meaningfully? Um, I think I would say the first thing would probably be a mindset. So performance measurement, uh, you know, and measuring everything to do with governments and, and the public sector uh, really took off due to new public management. And it's kind of as if we've never really recovered from that. And we tend to think of it as something that we do to control the sector. 
to try and punish and reward people. And I think that is really a big barrier. And we need to kind of shift the conversation away from that and think about how measurement can be something more um, uplifting, how measurement can be something more innovative and more positive than the way we've tended to think about how we should use it. So to me, one of the main barriers is really still trying to get over that, the, the legacy, I guess, of why we started doing a lot of the measurement that we do in public sector organisations. So an outdated mindset. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, you've got a long professional history with measurement, um, dating back to your days in the, the UK delivery unit. Um, I, I, I think you've changed your mind a little bit um, in the, you know, over the years. Um, what do you think the main barriers are? Um, <clears throat> uh, well, you're right. I have changed my mind over the years, and I think it's exactly reflecting the answer we just heard, which is that I think my beliefs, I suppose, my mindset around uh, measurement has has changed. Um, and I, I do think, sort of, to build on the, on uh, Jenny's answer just there, uh, our our public systems uh, and any large organisation really is is currently built on a set of assumptions which we don't necessarily talk about. And we can link back to, to NPM, but perhaps even, even before then. Uh, and to highlight one of those assumptions is the assumption that we can understand the world in a meaningful way through data and measurement. That is a, you know, that's a belief that, that we, in a sense, need to hold if we are to, um, if we're to work in large organisations, because uh, we're relying on data to, in many ways, inform our decisions and inform us about the outside world. And I think that's something that we're now challenging and we're seeing a lot of interesting discussions around is challenging the belief that data is truth or that data reveals a complete truth or a, or a whole truth. I don't think any of us believe that sort of in our hearts, but our organisations and particularly our, our, our public organisations uh, of interest to CPI in this discussion do have that assumption built in. So if we can start to challenge that through conversations like this, I think we would uh, we would be able to move towards more meaningful use of measurement. Thank you. And Sarah, um, do you agree that these are the biggest barriers? What other barriers are there? I think those are quite theoretical barriers. And yes, definitely, we almost need to figure out how do we all think uh, about the whole system and that complexity, but actually, oftentimes it's also the practical barrier of people along the funding chain have a lack of alignment of what measurement should look like. So you will be reporting to someone who says, oh, I know this is not the right way, but I am being asked by the people above me to do it like this. Uh, so in a more practical basis, it's about how do we uh, make measurements something that we all align on and that we are all on the same page on rather than the afterthought that once we've all agreed on what we're going to do someone says oh and we'll measure like this and there's that disagreement so what is the practical work we can all do to align on how we approach measurement and that um, aligns a bit with one of the first questions that I wanted to ask you which is who should decide what is measured and are they the right people or are the people who are deciding right now the right people? Uh, I think this is um, something that I feel really uh, strongly about, which is often when we all work in communities and for the public good, we often have people in positions of authority who are quite far away from the issues at hand, deciding what needs to be delivered and what needs to be measured and what is important and where the value lies. Um, and I think that makes us much less effective at our work. Um, so I am not advocating for some, uh, you know, tick boxing of asking the people what they think, but I am advocating for some really meaningful co-production, both in terms of, you know, what we care about, but also how we track, learn and measure things uh, when we deliver work. And I think that's really, really important if we're going to achieve any impact. Thank you. Adrian, um, you've done a lot of thinking about um, measurement for accountability, which is uh, the things that start. And um, we've just been kind of uh, hearing that the people who kind of make the measures 
are often not necessarily the people who are accountable uh, for the measures. How would you describe the difference between measuring for accountability and measuring for learning? Um, well, it does come back to the mindset, I think, which is when we when we gather data in our when our public systems uh, gather data, do we think of this primarily as a way of holding people to account? Or do we think of this as primarily a way of informing a discussion, a wider conversation about um, about what's going on? Something you might call sense sense making, understanding the world and sort of building a collective sense of uh, of what, what's happening in the world and how we should respond. Um, and there's actually a wonderful book called Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott, which I often refer to. Uh, and as you can tell from the title, Seeing Like a State, what he the point he makes there is that uh, the state um, views the world uh, through uh, the information it gathers uh, as a, a, a sort of a domain for control. And that's whether we as individuals believe that, but sort of institutionally, that's what Scott's argument is, a sort of, a sort of pathology of, of the state. Um, and I think that if we're to move to measurement for learning in a true sense, and this is why it's really difficult. It's it's not. It's going to be partially about the tools and, and the practices of measurement and how we might think differently about incorporating incorporating those into commissioning practices, into conversations about performance and what's happening. But it's also something deeper about the psychology of the organisations we work with, and that that is that is a tough nut to crack. But I think you know that's where we need to go. Where it helps for us to be straight that um, that is what we are dealing with essentially, rather than pretending mm. it's not about that. Um, yeah. As with so many things, it's all about power. Um, Sarah, um, do you have any examples of um, free work of, of how you get acceptance to change in an organisation from a model for measuring for accountability to measuring what's important, particularly given that what is important might not look as good when you measure it? hundred uh, percent. We have been on this journey for quite a while in Oxford, particularly working with um, the local authority, uh, local government. And one of the things that I always hold in the back of my mind is how do we shift from a focus on what are we doing to how are we doing it? And it's much, much harder to measure the how than to measure the what. But in the how is where the real impact is. Um, and I think what we have found is that on a lot of these things, you have to uh, show people examples of the ways in which uh, measuring can create incentives um, that are actually destroying the impact that you're trying to create. Um, so very briefly, last summer, we were told it's important, lockdown, we should uh, encourage active travel, and we were distributing bikes, and all of a sudden, they're like, oh, you've got this money, you've got to distribute bikes in two months. And all of a sudden, instead of our usual approach to distributing bikes, which is like tuition and relationships and understanding people's lives and barriers, we were just flogging bikes because someone said, you have to give this 100 bikes in two months. That was completely the wrong incentive and the wrong thing to track. Um, so we used storytelling to look at the impact of what those bikes were for people. And um, I can share like the story that changed everything for some of our partners it's called a very pink bike. And the woman who received that bike talked about the impact that that bike had in her life, which had nothing to do with the bike itself. And actually giving those examples and showing commissioners those stories and saying, what do you think the impact is here is what changes people's mindsets as to how do we grapple with the things that are harder to measure, but actually we can all agree that that is where the impact is. I wondered whether that was where that story was going. Like Jaws famously, the movie is not about the shark. I wondered whether it wasn't about the bike. Um, so counting bikes is actually the last thing that you want to do. Um, thank you. Um, Jenny, on the academic literature, what does it tell us about what's possible in measuring what's important rather than just what's, you know, most important for accountability? How much is it a technical issue, for example, how you measure collaboration, you know, sort of behaviours and activities as opposed to, the, you know, the what, the how rather than the what? Um, and is it just that we need the right measures or is it an inherent question about measurement itself? 
Yeah, thanks, Jane Francis. It's a great question. I think it's obviously, I think it's both. That's a very academic answer. So, you know, there's been quite a bit in the chat about the meaning of data and the, the stories about, you know, telling stories or telling narratives and qualitative data rather than quantitative. And I think, you know, that's really important because if you're just reducing everything to very simple numbers, then you're losing all the complexity of everything. And, and we do it because it's fast, but what we lose is really getting to, to a better understanding of what we're trying to get at. So it's partly about the measures, but it's, to me, it's much more actually about how we use the measures. Um, and the measures that we choose, of course, reflects how we intend to use them. So if we're moving from a more accountable control, we're going to use this to reward and punish you uh, way of thinking about measurement to we want to learn something from this and we want to improve, then we are probably going to collect different kinds of measures and we're going to tell more stories um, and we are going to use the data in a different way. And this comes to, you know, one of my pet points about performance measurement, which is this kind of paradox at the heart of it. The stuff you can do that's easy is quick and you can do it, you know, really quickly come up with a number, their X and their Y, but you lose all of that complexity. And more is not always better, but less will generally not tell you what's going on. Mm. So if you just stick to the quantitative, you're going to miss an awful lot. Yeah, uh, and I think probably the other thing that, that we should say is there's measurement and then there's performance measurement. You know, we all want to measure stuff. Like we, we're all religiously watching the COVID numbers every day. That's a measure. But when it becomes a target or when it becomes something that you use to direct uh, what people are doing, then that's when we start to get the problems. Yeah, no, it's amazing how much you can end up focusing on those numbers and what the day's number is. And I, I don't know about anyone else who might be who's joining us from Melbourne, but the numbers that there's been over the last few days and the last week have been quite similar. There's 11 for two days and 20 for two days and then 21, 22. And the number was one of the only ways that I knew what day it was. And so if the numbers are the same, then we're completely lost. Um, so, um, and as you say, it misses, uh, misses an awful lot about um, uh, what, what the, the, the important things that are, are going on. Jenny, can I ask you another question? Um, you've been doing some work on how best to measure the impact of academia, academics, academic work on, on, on the real world. Um, what are your conclusions and, and do you think academics would welcome them? Yeah, I do. And I think, you know, what, what we've kind of found very much resonates with some of the discussion we've already had. So if someone tells you what's important is X, and that's the only thing that matters, then you don't, you know, most of us don't take too kindly to that. But if you engage in a conversation with what is actually a value here and what would, you know, make your work better, how would you help society more? if we thought about, you know, the work that you were doing as an academic in a different way, then academics start to think about this very differently, right? It's not, you know, it's a very interesting phenomenon that a lot of the kind of research performance measurement systems we have in Australia and the UK and other countries were kind of constructed based on the things that academics, you know, do, publish papers, you know, <laughs> give a number of talks, do this, do that. And someone described it to me from, from Hefke, the Higher Ed Education Funding Council of England, as collecting this and then turning the mirror back on academics and saying, you told us this what's important. Now, we're going to measure you on this by counting it, right? So it, it's a kind of, it's a kind of demonstration of how those things can be kind of they can even start from a really good intention, but end up in a place that is not really helpful 
to the and city. nobody intended to end up in that place. Yeah, or to the people that you know who are working in the system. Yeah, weaponized. Someone's just put in the. <laughs> yeah and um so to, to adrian now there's another theme that's uh, coming up in the chat is that you know we would we would love to think that we can measure better for learning um kind of in shift from the kind of control aspect of accountability but how do we maintain accountability um uh, given that shift can you have accountability without any control um, a colleague of mine, Toby Lowe, uh, talks talks very uh, sensibly about accountability, I think, when he talks about uh, accountability is giving an account. So it's, can you offer an account for what is happening? It is not necessary, although in our in our minds now, we've, we've tended to just sort of assume that accountability is kind of scorekeeping or, or, or keep putting numbers on things. So uh, accountability in that sense is for me anyway if you're going to give an account that's that sort of puts forward the notion first of all you're going to you're going to say something you're going to be offering a narrative informed by numbers but to give an account is to give a narrative i think or to engage in a conversation in a discussion even better um so and i and there have been some great questions in the uh, in the chat about it you know in, in a world where politicians have to stand up and defend these programs we have to have accountability for public spending taxpayers and the media are, are asking questions all the time how can we um uh how, how can we do without account about these con the, the control metrics i suppose and i think we have to it's hard but i think we have to challenge that sense that the accountability we have through numbers is any is in any sense true accountability. I think it's convenient accountability for everybody because you can point to numbers going up, going down. People can say, you know, we, we don't like this number, we like that number. Uh, and it kind of puts the conversation onto a kind of onto a playing field that everybody can can um, can see. I suppose. Are you suggesting it's an illusion of control? It's not actually control. I think it's it is an illusion of control, and you know the illusion is, as has been said before, you know the map is not the terrain. When we look, we're looking at the numbers. When we look at spreadsheets and PowerPoint slides and Excel sheets, we're looking at an abstraction of reality. But it's so easy to forget that because the whole conversation becomes about the spreadsheet and far too quickly, and not about the reality informed. Uh, by the spreadsheet. Now we have to find ways, and I think that you know that you can think of um, leaders, including political leaders, who are who are willing to challenge this notion. I think politicians themselves, of course, trade in stories. They they, they use numbers, uh, but they trade in stories. So sh th these are people who sh who are actually very well attuned to thinking along these lines. But um, we sort of accidentally reinforce a more numerical way of thinking through our systems and, and the sort of data that we provide them. And we also know that politicians can um, use different numbers in response to uh, what is happening with numbers. Um, Sarah, um, I noticed you smiling when um, uh, uh, during uh, that exchange there. Is is there a, is there something in in your experience you can share with us about this kind of sense that? You know, this is really just an illusion of control that there is. I'm going to give you all an example of what I am currently doing for accountability uh, for a large funder. Every month I send a spreadsheet to an unmonitored inbox. And that is what I am doing for accountability, just in case at some point into the future, somebody might look at the numbers or might have to go through some sort of audit trail. And it is such an illusion. And I wish I was being held accountable for the spend of that money in a meaningful way. Uh, but sending a spreadsheet every month to an unmonitored inbox <laughs> is not real accountability. So I would like to be held more accountable as someone who is delivering programs for the social good. Um, so I don't want to fall into that trap that people say, oh, you know, I just want to be trusted. I just want to do my thing. Like, of course, we need to be held accountable for public money, as somebody was saying in the chat but let's do that well, rather than by pretending that we're holding people accountable. So, so much of this seems to be about um, our need to find shortcuts 
you know, Adrian, you need to find a map because the terrain is too complicated uh, and so on. And maybe you, there's a lot of projects um, that, you know, uh, the funders have to track. And so they're trying to figure out some kind of shortcut to get to some kind of meaningful kind of sense of what's going on. Um, but it can go wrong so easily. Um, so Adrian, on the map and terrain thing, I, I was sort of really kind of completely like measurement, whether we measure or we don't measure, we, we hold a map of the world in our head anyway. You know, there is a facsimile, a kind of a, you know, we have the route to work back when we used to be able to actually go to work uh, and so on. Um, does, do you think that the kind of, um, that good measurement is something that helps us sharpen our map of the world instead of distorting it? Or do you think that there's just a real problem with the amount of shortcutting that we're doing? I think a lot of the problems come from the eternal desire to do things at scale. When we, when we want to do this at scale, if, if I'm at the top of an organisation of which Sarah's um, organisation is sitting out there in the, in the funding universe, I cannot have the kind of conversation with her that she's asking for because I'd have to have th a thousand of them. So when we have hierarchical systems that are built for scale, the only way they can reasonably proceed unless we invent some AI that can, do, that can handle all of this for us is through massive simplification. And data is the, is the, the and, I, and I know in the chat people said data, do you mean warm data? I'm talking about numbers primarily. That, that is wonderful if you're sitting at the top of a hierarchy and trying to understand everything out there in the world. You, you need simple, clear, comparable, consistent sources of information coming in primarily that, that you can that you can have discussions about and then use to make decisions and, and manage the organization through. If we didn't, if, if we said, but what if we could, uh, what if we didn't have to do this at scale? What if the accountabilities could be held much closer to where the action is? That would remove, then it would be very bizarre if I had a personal relationship with the people I was funding. And of course, these do exist in organizations. It would be bizarre if I showed up and said, you know, give me the Excel spreadsheet to the anonymous inbox. And that's what I'll base the conversation on. That would just, that would be dehumanizing. It would be antisocial. It'd be weird. Um, but organizationally, that's what we do. So I think we have to challenge scale because that's what necessitates this, this behavior. And if we can, if we can think about accountabilities nested lower levels in the system, then we can start to have these more meaningful, more human, more uh, rich conversations that weave data and stories and, and everything else together. But you, I just don't know if you can do that at scale. So um, you run an organization, the Center for Public Impact. Um, uh, how, how do, how, and it's, it's not a small organization, it's not an enormous organization. Um, are there ways that you guys have been thinking about, you know, how to put something like that into practice? Well, we are only 50 people. So, we, so I think on the, on the grand scheme of things, we're quite a small organization. But we, um, we have experimented with self-management, which is, um, uh, you know, a form of organizing, which assumes that you trust people to make the right decisions. Uh, people, are empowered to make decisions they don't have to it's not assumed that you test things by running them up the high up the up the line everybody sort of starts with the assumption that they can make the decisions they need to do to do their job and then you consult and engage with other people as you see fit in order to fulfill your role now that you know i realize that we're on the sort of boundary here but people are probably familiar with Burt's org and other organizations that adopt self-management practices in the public sector and do it and actually do it at scale so it, it is possible i'm not saying that's i'm not saying self-management is the be all and end all but i think there's a really fascinating movement which is challenging the way we organize 
thinking about hierarchy and how we can do things differently, challenging about how the way we, we view the world, how we understand reality, as I suppose, what do we give preeminence to in the information we're seeking, challenging some of the tenets of economics. Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, similarities between some of these movements and we need to be exploring across all of these fronts uh, to try and find some of the answers for how we, how we want to uh, address some of these challenges in the public sector. Sarah, um, I'm just wondering, um, we've just got um, uh, three or four minutes before we kind of um, split into groups. Um, do you have any kind of examples of where you've seen this kind of thing done well? Um, or, you know, of metrics that have actually improved over time into something better? Um, so a few things to highlight. Uh, we have done lots of work around storytelling based on most significant change and uh, in partnership with Arts at the Old Fire Station, uh, who are doing lots of um, storytelling evaluation work in the UK. Uh, and it's that they have a lot of the resources online. And what I love about it is how participatory it is as a method. And I think bringing in voices from different contexts and people who are directly experiencing the issues at hand can be really powerful. Um, we experimented working with CPI and Oxford City Council with learning pods as an opportunity for people who are closest to the issues again, and perhaps at like, you know, uh, working more on the front line to really um, drive improvements by learning from their work rather than just, um, you know, submit returns, uh, which perhaps they don't see as valuable. So to create spaces that they find valuable. Um, and I think on the whole, the most interesting thing is how do we give people the opportunity to reflect and control, uh, reflect on the things that they have control over, because I think we can probably all agree that if we control for high quality, we are more likely to deliver good outcomes. But for people doing the work, they're more in control of the quality than on the outcome. And the youth sector in the UK has done really interesting stuff recently that shows, uh, that has been academically published now, that shows for high quality youth provision, you're more likely to, to deliver those outcomes. So how can we move away from pretending that a 13% increase in confidence for a child means anything, because it really doesn't. And how can we focus instead on what is in front of us and giving that really great experience for the kids in a youth club? Um, so yeah, those are my, uh, the things that I am yeah, interested that, in at that the sounds, That sounds great, particularly, um, uh, um, during a pandemic, it's important to keep remembering to tell ourselves the good stories as well as um, talking about the challenges and the barriers. And I can see in the chat that um, some people are putting their examples of kind of, um, uh, you know, things that work. And I'd encourage people to share their experience of things that work. Um, uh, it would be great. I also noticed that someone, um, uh, Mark Upton has written maybe a different type of scaling mass localism, which is a phrase that I love. I remember someone uh, say, asking me once whether I was happy with the pace of change on something and didn't we need a revolution? Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm now, I guess, in my middle age, um, aware that revolutions can have unintended consequences. You know, I've read my Edwin, Edmund Burke and so on, but I said that I was very up for faster incrementalism. <laughs> <laughs> that was really important. Um, well, thank you. We're now going to move to um, uh, uh, breakout discussions. I want to say first, these groups are optional. If you don't want to join a break, breakout, um, then when the thing comes up, click later rather than join group and go and get a cup of tea or, or whatever it is that um, uh, you can, uh, well, get, whatever you want to do for 10 minutes and rejoin us in 10 minutes to hear the remaining uh, panel discussion. Um, and we've deliberately kind of left more time after the breakouts so that we can really discuss the questions and insights that come from those. Now, if you do join, um, I'll read out in a second the questions that we'd like you to discuss in your groups, um, and they will also be posted in the chat. Um, uh, get one person in your group to, to write down the thoughts um, and then add those reflections to the chat when you rejoin the main group. And we will then use those to guide the discussion with the panel afterwards, as long with any other questions that you have for the panel. Um, if you have any issues, send um, a direct message to the ANZOG 
host. And so with that, can I ask Shannon to divide us into groups and see you all in 10 minutes. Thanks, Jane Francis. So I'm sending everybody to breakout rooms now. Um, like Jane Francis said, it is optional. So click um, accept or later, depending on your choice. Um, there is a call for help button in the breakout rooms if you do need um, any support. And the questions are in the chat. I forgot to read them out, but I do go and read them in the chat. They are, and we'll broadcast them throughout, throughout the breakout session as well. So Thank you. moving everybody now. Welcome back. Um, so please contribute your notes from the breakout groups and any other questions that you have into chat. And I understand that that will kind of take you uh, that will take a couple of minutes and for us to get our heads around stuff kind of coming into the chat and so on. And so in the meantime, I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask um, all of the panel and um, that we've been uh, drawing on things that we noticed on the chat from before the breakout groups. Um, the first question that I have, and I'm going to give it to um, ask it to Sarah, is given that we see, we sound like we're, we're really agreed that the current system of measuring uh, for control is just not working, you know, really almost for anyone. Um, do you think that we should experiment with more just not measuring? I think I am interested in the idea of who is holding us accountable when we deliver working communities. Um, so I think I'm not saying we shouldn't measure at all. I would like to be thoughtful about whose power, whose voice comes out on that measurement. Um, so someone was talking in the chat about being a dichotomy between quantitative and qualitative. And I say it a bit differently, which is being a dichotomy between numbers who are produced by the machine versus stories who are uh, told by the people who are directly affected by the um, issues and they're told in their own voice and on their own terms um, so I think for me the interesting thing is how do we move to hearing those voices directly and how do we move to being held accountable by the people who are affected by the issues and the people who are directly affected by the work we are delivering rather than by you know some elected officials who have been elected by you know an election where often the turnout locally is really low and they might not even have direct experience of the issues at hand. Um, so yeah, I think that's the thing that I'm most interested in around accountability. I think that is true democracy actually. And uh, I don't want to say let's not measure, let's not be accountable. I want to measure and to be held accountable and to be challenged, um, but by the right people. Um, thank you. Um, and um, I, I think you, I heard you um, uh, mentioning somewhere before is like, you know, we need to be clear about who it is that's delivering outcomes. Um, in many cases, it's people delivering outcomes for themselves. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I think uh, we often in the social sector, for sure, like begin uh, because we are put in a position in which we have to claim that we have all of this impact. So we might tutor a child a day a week on maths and then we say, oh, thanks to this tutoring, this child now has got like a fantastic mark. But actually, that child has got that outcome for themselves. That child woke up in the morning and said, actually, I am going to study and I'm going to take my maths uh, GCSE seriously and I'm going to do a good job. That is on them. It's not on us as governments or organizations or external people. And so I think we also need to be clear about what can be attributed to us. Uh, and, you know, we we're talking about it earlier. The quality of what we deliver can be attributed to us. The final outcome cannot be attributed to us. So let's not measure that outcome outcome and pretend we're delivering it for people because people are delivering those outcomes for themselves. And this relates to a comment that Kathy Sharp has just made is like, how do we think that change actually happens? Um, you know, it's, uh, um, sure, it's that old thinking about kind of doing to people and doing for people as opposed to enabling people to, um, you know, do stuff for themselves. Um, uh, thank you. So um, I just another kind of thing, um, uh, Graham Smith, control is not necessarily bad. Um, uh, th this next kind of question I have, I'm going to um, uh, ask Adrian to comment on, um, which is that, um, you know, we've been talking about sort of um, organisations outside government, but for governments themselves, isn't it the legislative reality um, that 
it's just not conducive to being innovative or to kind of changing around this kind of stuff. I think it's, you know, we've, we've got to take account of the uh, legislative framework within which we operate, of course. Um, and I and I accept, I did see a comment uh, earlier on that, uh, you know, the the legal requirements on on public bodies in terms of accountability for for public expenditure uh, and for the results they're achieving are often you know setting the agenda here whether we sort of whether we like it or not i would which so we clearly we need to recognize that fact however i would say that the the legislative em environments in which we operate were create were created by human beings we can uncreate them um, and, and create something better uh, if if we want to. Um, and potentially at a local level, we have a little bit more flexibility to be able to think creatively about this. And this is where I think we do see examples um, of quite interesting thinking uh, taking place. I, I will give a plug actually to Human Learning Systems, which is something that CPI has been working on, um, Toby, Lowe, Toby Lowe's work I mentioned earlier. On the Human Learning Systems website, there are a lot of case studies. It's not specifically about measurement, uh, but it's about how to adopt some of the principles that we're talking about. And and if anyone's interested in sort of pr the practical realities of trying to embrace a different mindset around some of this stuff, I would definitely recommend uh, the Human Learning Systems case study library as a, as a great source of inspiration, which is primarily public sector. Thank you. And, uh, and here's an, another question. Um, what kind of end state for measurement do we think we should be trying to get to? I'm going to ask all the panel members this question, starting with Jenny. Okay, that's a good one. Um, what sort of end state? So I, I've been reflecting on some, some things going back to the idea that we do need to measure in some way. And what are some really good examples of that? So I think some of the best, um, best examples I've seen, and it goes back to the quantitative versus qualitative stuff that's been coming up in the chat too, is where people uh, or where you know, systems try to focus on a small number of things that can be relatively easily counted and then give permission uh, uh, to local groups to come up with the things that are most important in that area. So to me, if we start from, a, if we don't go the Adrian route and say, let's just unmake it all, or let's just not do it for a year, or let's, you know, let's do something really exciting. But if we say, we've got a measure, how can we make it better at scale? Then one of the things I would say would be as an endpoint, you have a small number of indicators that don't take too much trouble to actually collect. And then for each unit, each geographical area, each whichever it is, you say what's the most important thing to you and you get them to measure in some sense that which is important to them. So if I was to kind of think about an end state that's not the let's just stop doing it all, but was to how do we actually try and do something that's a bit better, then it would be something along those lines. Thank you. Sarah? I think I would keep it very simple and I would say, can we agree that we are going to recognize complexity in our measuring? And can we agree that we're going to recognize the system as a whole rather than one individual organization delivering one specific bit of the change? And then if we agree that we're going to recognize complexity and the whole system in our measurement, can we then design measurement approaches that fit within that? And can we innovate and can we play with different things? Can we play with storytelling? Can we play with learning approaches um, that bring in different voices? Um, so I don't know what the end state is. I don't think anybody knows. I hope that if we knew, we would already be doing it. Uh, but can we hold ourselves to account in those two things like complexity, whole systems, and then figure out where we go from there. Thank you, Adrian. You have the magic wand for two, a minute and a half. Use it wisely. <laughs> um, well, I'd agree, I'd agree with what's been said. I think there is a, to pick up a sort of, uh, you know, to explore, maybe there's a point of disagreement here because we're trying to find reasons to disagree on the panel and make it more interesting. Um, I suppose there's a 
there's a question running through the comments, running through the sponsors. It's, what, are, we pragma, are we pragmatists? <laughs> Do we believe that we can incrementally shift where we are today to something like what we're talking about in the future? Uh, or do we believe that there's something very deep and fundamental which needs to be challenged and it's a more sort of paradigm sort of shift kind of place where we are? Um, and to at, at, at the risk of sounding uh, like I'm sort of just wanted to stir up trouble here, whilst I'm open to the idea that we can incrementally perhaps iterate there, I do feel that there's something very deep and very sort of uh, important underpinning in a very sort of invisible way a lot of the way the language used even the word delivery earlier Jane Francis you said the delivery of outcomes that is a mechanistic linear way of thinking and I'm, I don't I'm not sort of blaming you for that because that's the way we talk and we we are in a uh, we are in a paradigm uh, that I do think we need to find a way of at least challenging if not trying to step out of so whilst I uh, you know, I I want to believe we can make progress through sort of incremental improvement of the system. I do believe that there is a space for the for the revolutionaries if they want to take it to to ask something much deeper and more fundamental. Thank you. So um, I'm going to stick with you, Adrian, for this question. This is a question that's come out of one of the groups, and it's about how and where should quantitative data sit in feedback loops. So George Arnold's group disagreed that outcomes shouldn't be measured just because they're delivered by individuals because that feedback loop is critical for achieving outcomes. And also, if you don't measure it, how can you kind of, um, uh, kind of track change over time or getting better um, at doing things? Um, well, again, let, let me just be provocative to, to stir things up. The, uh, to say that if we don't measure it, how do we know it is, I think, just, just fundamentally wrong. It, almost the reverse is true. I think when we measure something, we obscure it. We obscure it to, to the degree that the measure doesn't capture the full truth. So in any situation that is complex, that involves human beings, human relationships, uh, that cannot be easily distilled into numbers, when we measure something, we actually, it's an, actually an act of, of um, simplification, as we've, as, as we've already said. So rather than saying if we can't measure something how can we improve we should be saying if we measure something what risks does that actually have of, of obscuring the truth and us learning if we measure will it will it prevent us from learning because we'll become obsessed with the things that we've measured and not the wider picture and we should treat measurement as a very very powerful and dangerous tool in that sense that we that we wield extremely carefully and not just liberally and sort of uh, very optimistically just apply just say and let's put some numbers on it because that's going to definitely make it better it isn't definitely going to make it better it may well make things worse and if we don't start with that assumption I think we, we get ourselves into difficulty and I say this to provoke as much as anything else oh sure uh, Jenny what do you make of that Well, Adrian may have aimed to provoke, but I, I'm afraid I feel that I do have to agree, much as I would like to disagree, just for, just for the sake of the argument. Um, you know, I, I think that working in a university and seeing all the measurement that goes on and all the, the actual damage it's doing to people's careers because of the obsession with particular numbers, I think probably the best thing we could do for lots of people working in universities is stop measuring everything we do. It's really damaging. So, you know, I, I would love to think we're in a place where we could do that, but, you know, the reality, at least in Australia, is the relevance to society needs to be demonstrated. We need to keep showing that that money that's being spent on people working in universities is well spent and the need to somehow do that. And it, it does involve allocating numbers to these things. Uh, you know, I, I would love to think we do away with that, but I don't, <laughs> I don't see it. Um, and that resonates with, I guess, a lot of 
a lot of the comments we've been hearing. And, the, and you're the right that we really do measure everything. In fact, um, there'll be evaluation forms go out after the seminar and our <laughs> performances as speakers and as a moderator um, will be measured uh, and everything. And um, I'm, I'm a bit worried about um, the fact that I've raised expectations about my cat um, who is fast asleep on the chair behind me. Um, so there's some uh, great comments coming up in the um, in the chat. I love it. Adrian about the, the thing that you were talking about, kind of complexity and so on. Graham Smith said, um, attributed to Einstein was the phrase, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler, um, which I thought was great. Um, here, here's another um, uh, well, well, uh, really into question. So this is from Christy Milela. Um, I hope I've got your name right. Sorry. Should we be more clear about the intent of the measurement. Um, so is it, you know, for each measurement, is it a performance or accountability measure or is it a learning measurement? Um, because sometimes we might have to um, measure for accountability, we may have no choice around it, but at least if we're um, clearer about the intent of what we're measuring, we can treat the measure uh, kind of in, in, a, in a different way. Um, Sarah, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. And can we, while we do that, shift the focus towards learning? Um, so, you know, I was talking about sending my accountability reports to this unmonitored inbox. Actually, I would love to share some of the learning that we're picking up from that work um, and who is out there in this, you know, funding chain saying, hey, guys, what are you learning? Nobody. So how can you all in this webinar become that person who says, actually what learning processes do I want to create? Um, because it's hard to do that in the hustle and bustle of getting things done and we all know that. Um, you know, we all know what good delivery looks like. You know, it's efficient, people are not waiting forever, like people are having a good experience, people are turning up, but we don't always know what good learning looks like. Like what is the process that draws those things? So as people in those chains, how can you encourage those processes and those experiences to draw that insight? Mm, thank you. Uh, my favourite typo of the seminar has happened in the chat. It says uh, the obsession with measurement seems to be a hangover from the MBA bloom and the desire for micromanagement. I think they might have meant the MBA boom, um, but I love the idea of an MBA bloom. It's like kind of algae um, that's uh, bad for lakes. Um, Here's a question from, um, and again, I hope I'm getting the uh, um, uh, pronunciation right, Ruth Radke. Um, how would you sum up the evolution of measurement? This, this, this is a question I think it might be made for Adrian. Look, he's smiling even before I said his name. <laughs> I, I was actually smiling because Liz said she did mean Bloom, so it wasn't a typo. Which, oh, um, right. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a correct in case, language. I'll take it in that case. I have an MBA. <laughs> <and> <laughs> 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 Um, sorry, the question was the evolution of measurement. Yeah, how would you sum up the evolution of it? Um, I, I think we, in one in one sense, we haven't moved on a great deal over <laughs> over quite a long period of time because there is uh, this, you know, going back to to Fordism in a sense, this sense that we can measure processes, measure the world around us to. to to understand them and that's where managerialism comes from this idea that there's a class of people who are managers who can then use this information to make the world better and there's a whole you know that's the that's where MBAs I've got an MBA you know, this is what we learned <laughs> I love um, that the people who have MBAs are confessing it in this <laughs> confe yes I, I'd like to take this opportunity it to admit that I've got one <laughs> um, and and that that line of thinking that sort of intellectual line of thinking is a hundred years old is older than a hundred years old um and, and and actually hasn't changed much i think there's there's then a, a sort of movement counter movement which in some sense is the pendulum swings completely the other direction that says this is all nonsense we need to be just empowering people letting them get on with it all the managers are a waste of time and and you know the, we should have as much localism accountability and freedom as possible which is I, i'm you know i might admit that i'm more, <laughs> more on that side there these days um but I think what this conversation is showing is we, 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 are, we are trying to find a synthesis. We, we do recognize that there's truth in both these, uh, these views. Um, and, and what the most in, the interesting discussions that, I, that I'm like this and, and others I'm taking part in and CPI we're trying to um, encourage is exploring what that synthesis could look like. Because it's not as straightforward as just saying, well, let's kind of throw it all together and, 
and and hope for the best or that we just sort of do a bit of everything and mix and match i think there is there is some intellectual um ground to be gained by really asking under what circumstances and how can we start to to, to blend these ideas uh together so i i in one sense you know nothing's changed since since uh, ford but then in, an, in another sense i think we are making progress it, we have to believe it. That's what helps us get up in the morning, I think. There's a great insight here from George Arnold, um, who says, I totally agree that measurement's a simplification of the truth, but reality can't be coped with without some degree of simplification. We do it all the time. Also agree it's dangerous to obsess over a few key measures. There needs to be a balance. Um, and so I, I think maybe as with many of these things, the, 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 the truth is found um uh in 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 the middle um so <sighs> jane francis you've just gone on mute there i have no idea how i managed that <laughs> sarah is there anything else you picked up in the chat that you'd like to comment on or anything that adrian or jenny's just said I really like someone made a comment about how if done well measurement itself can advance the work that we're trying to do and I think in some settings uh, particularly in the youth world uh, that has been something that people have been really grappling with like how can measurement go with a grain on the, of delivery it's ridiculous to think that we sometimes still give children like 15 page youth outcomes questionnaires uh so actually how can we move away from that or like a lot of the criticism that toby Lowe has done around the outcome star towards actually using some of those measurements to help people in their journey of change but that is completely incompatible with measurement for control so let's also be clear about that mm. so um, we've talked about needing a balance. Um, uh, a question from Christabel Darcy, how do we know if we've got the balance right to get meaningful measurement? Any concrete examples? And, and let me go through our three panellists um, super quickly. Jenny. Well, how do we know if you've got the um, right. balance right? Yeah. Um, I think if we get beyond doing it for the sake of doing it, and we're doing it um, and learning something from it and learning to improve from it, that to me would definitely be a sign that we're getting towards some kind of balance instead of going through the motions simply because we have to. It's about concentrating on the quality of the relationship, isn't it? The, and mm -hmm. the communication and the trust. And there's about uh, uh, Sarah. Are you involving different voices? Are you shifting power? And are you being creative in the way that you are doing it? Um, I think less questionnaires, more experiential approaches that actually draw people's true experiences of things. Those are my uh, quick reflections. Adrian. I've just posted in the chat uh, an example from Finland. Uh, I'm, I, I live in Sweden, I'm a sweet from Sweden, so near neighbours here, Finland, uh, have really been thinking deeply about how improvement happens in their education system, which is already well regarded, as, as many people on this call will know. Um, and they, I think, have done some really interesting uh, work around how to balance the autonomy and the prof the, the emphasis on professionalism and professional freedom that is required for, for, for improvement and learning with uh, a, the need for a, a national strategy, I suppose, in a, in a sense that uh, this, this is a, a whole school system and not just a whole bunch of atomized schools. Um, and I'd recommend that as a practice, if people are asking, sort of give me a practical example of how this can work at scale, to, go against a little bit of what I said earlier about scale. I think the Finland the Finland schools example is a very nice one. The link's in the chat. Thank you. And uh, Dan Hanrahan um, uh, has just shared the APGAR score is a good example of um, simple data being used to improve mother and child outcomes uh, after birth and, um, uh, and, and has posted a, a, an article from New Yorker where Atul Gawande has written on that. So it will be, as well as full of insight, it will be uh, beautifully written. Um, the uh, 
there's a, a, a really interesting comment from Amy Everett as well, saying it's slow going, but there's seen value in changing mindsets to allow for stories to be gathered and shared, but there needs to be an appetite um, for this. So this, again, kind of goes back to that kind of sense that, you know, we can all help each other kind of grow the appetite within organisations and between organisations um, for that uh, kind of um, uh, data. We're coming up, we've just got about three minutes left and I've got some uh, finishing um, sort of housekeeping to do. Um, I, I, the, my, my, my system appears to be muting itself. I believe the cat has uh, been uh, getting the blame for it in the chat. As it turns out, she's actually, well, she's woken up now. She's, she's down there um, behaving herself. She had actually started snoring reasonably quieter earlier, which was uh, a bit embarrassing. I don't think it was um, possible. So look, I want to give a huge thank you to our panelists um, who have joined us from different points on the planet at different times of the day um, uh, to give us um, uh, their insights and they've tried really hard to disagree with each other, um, which we really appreciate. <laughs> um, and also thanks to all of the audience for coming and uh, we hope to see you at our next and final webinar for the year, which will be on the 14th of August. Uh, August? the 14th of October, uh, exploring the theme of system stewardship. It will be hosted by Sally Washington uh, of ANZOG, and panellists will include Toby Lowe, who you've heard mentioned here, uh, Lynn Mumford, uh, Kim Peake, and Lil Anderson. Um, and between now and then, we'd really love you to access our Reimagining Government website, uh, and this thing's disappeared from my skin. Here we go. Reimagine Government Series website, which has material on today's topic, including case studies, interviews, and articles. Um, and they're really keen to foster a community passionate about reimagining government. So I invite you to join our community of practice where we got some of those questions from earlier. And where was the first time that I saw a thing called a Miro board, um, which was great. Um, They'll be hosting interactive sessions, workshops, conversations and networking opportunities. And here, this next point is about the measurement that we promised about this webinar. We'll be circulating a post webinar survey It will arrive in your inbox shortly. And as we were talking about the importance of the intent of measurement, I want to absolutely <laughs> <laughs> emphasize as facilitator that um, the feedback will help ensure our conversations and method of delivery are relevant to you. So it's about making this better uh, rather than uh, giving us points over time, hopefully. Um, and they'll be writing a short wrap up blog on today's webinar. Um, we'll capture the chat in a Google Doc so everybody will get it uh, and publish a graphic recording. So keep your an eye out for that too. It will be published on our microsite as well. Um, so that's it from us. Um, I just want to give a shout out to everyone who is in lockdown in different places. Those of you who have done those hard yards and are now kind of getting out and about, um, please en en enjoy it. Uh, enjoy it responsibly, as they say. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you to everyone uh, for participating. Thank you very much.